Tibetans, we believe rebirth. All the sentient beings are rebirth. Rebirth is unlimited. It's not beginning. It already exists. Our body is a vessel of the consciousness. And when your consciousness travels to the next form, that's your vessel. Reincarnation is widely dismissed in mainstream science as nothing more than a belief or a fantasy. But you might be surprised to learn, as I certainly was, that there's actually a significant body of scientific research around this topic, and leading academic institutions have entire departments dedicated to studying the possibility of life after death. At the University of Virginia, the Division of Perceptual Studies was founded in 1967 specifically to investigate reincarnation, believe it or not. And since that time, it has documented thousands of cases of young children who, from the time they could speak, reported memories of a past life. This work began here at the University of Virginia back around 1960. Uh, Ian Stevenson was the chairman of the Department of Psychiatry. When he heard about these cases from various parts of the world of very young children who said that they remember previous lives, and he was curious enough where he decided to investigate and spent the next 40 years of his career traveling to various parts of the world. And he and his colleagues during that time, we've now collected over 2,500 cases of these young children who were making these claims. He wrote in an academic style and like a lawyer, presenting the witnesses where the evidence came from. He had subjects take lie detector tests, sign affidavits. He was so concerned that the evidence would be accepted in the scientific community. One of the things you'll find that when you read the case studies, there's a kind of force to the case studies. It was good research, empirical research, and that it rendered it a scientific question and that I couldn't think of any alternative explanation as plausible for the data as that some people reincarnate. James Leininger was a little boy in Louisiana who uh, began saying that his plane had crashed, that he had been shot down by the Japanese. He gave some very specific details. In fact, um, that this was when he was two and he was able to say that he had been shot down by the Japanese and that his plane had flown from the Natoma is what he named the boat that his plane had taken off of. In addition, the, the boy later saw a picture of Iwo Jima and said that was where he was shot down. Also, it began saying that uh, he was the third James. When his dad searched online, um, he eventually found that there was the USS Natoma Bay. The Natoma Bay was involved in the Iwo Jima operation. There was one pilot from the Natoma that was killed in, in Iwo Jima and his name was James Houston, Jr. So James Leininger would be the third James after the, the junior. Another detail that James gave was that he had a friend named Jack Larson, and it turned out that there was another pilot on the Natoma named Jack Larson. In the typical Ian Stevenson case, as soon as a child can speak, the child will name their own name from the past lifetime, the parent's name, uh, names of other relatives and the geographic location of the past life home. And so the child eventually gives enough information that the biologic parents can locate the past life of family. We use the term salt and unsalt. And salt means that a previous person has been identified whose life matches the statements that the child made. Of the 2,500, uh, it's probably roughly 50-50 the ones that have been solved versus not solved. Some of these cases are undeniably mind-boggling and they challenge many of our basic assumptions about life and death and the nature of consciousness. Uh, reincarnation is, is certainly a, a plausible I would say in some cases it's for me the most compelling interpretation even though it's not the only one. And the evidence is not flawless, uh, every case has some weakness or other, uh, but there is an accumulation of quite strong evidence. Now evidence is obviously not the same as proof, of course, but it's amazing to think that there are thousands of these cases from all over the world where children are reporting all kinds of obscure and specific details from a past life that can be independently validated and confirmed to be accurate. I mean, how do you explain that? If the child can't even read or write yet, 
where does this information come from? And even if just one of these cases turned out to really be legitimate, that alone would forever change our understanding of life and death, of who we are and where we come from. So yeah, what do you guys think? <laughs> Definitely curious to hear your perspective. Could this be a key to learning more about life and death and the nature of consciousness? Is there proof that our current scientific paradigm of materialism is wrong? It's incomplete and that there is more to life than what meets the eye. I think that this research is important because it suggests that life after death isn't necessarily just a fantasy or belief. It can also be approached in an analytic and rational and evidence-based way. As I discussed in some of my previous videos, in my perspective, there already is abundant evidence that consciousness does indeed survive beyond death. When you combine new discoveries in quantum physics with research into near-death experiences, out-of-body experiences, psychedelic states, mysticism, shamanism, remote viewing, and much, much more, it becomes very evident that there is more to the mystery of consciousness, the mystery of what we are, than we currently understand. All of this really leaves us with more questions than answers. What is the nature of consciousness? Is there life after death? If so, what is that deeper truth to what we are, to who we are, that continues on? And as we ponder life's mysteries, it's worth noting that perhaps the greatest mystery of them all is not out there somewhere in the universe, but within, in the very core of our being.